All right, we're live. Hey. Here we are. Hi, Greg. Hi, everyone. Um, all right, we are. Confirmation, we are live. So I wanted to, well, first of all, thank you, Greg, for writing this book, but also for having me here for this launch. Um, and everyone who is here uh, to this conversation hosted by the Radical Books Collective. Um, my name is Chelsea Sieber. Uh, I teach French and Francophone studies at Catholic University. And here I am here with the author of this wonderful book, Decolonize Hipsters, by um, Gregory Piero, who is associate professor at the University of Connecticut, author of um, other books, actually, recently of um, The Black Avenger in Atlantic Culture, um, as well as a really exciting forthcoming um, anthology of Haitian revolutionary fictions, the University of Virginia Press, um, which is co-edited with Marlena Doubt and Marion Ruth, Ruth Leitner. Thank you. Um, and also really a bunch of cool uh, projects that are sort of associated with both the um, Radical Books Project and um, decolonization more broadly. Um, uh, most recently, this wonderful um, Los Angeles Review of Books project too. So maybe we can link to all of that um, as well. So uh, because this is a launch, because I get to ask the first question, although um, please everyone ask your questions on social media so that we can engage them in this conversation. Um, my first question uh, really is just sort of to get us into the book and maybe first for those who are not familiar, um, and if you haven't uh, had a chance to read it all, say a few words about it myself, although of course um, Greg can also speak to it um, as he is the author. But Decolonized Hipsters is a brilliant handbook um, for the revolutionary overthrow of embedded colonial ideas, the series with OR Books. Um, it lays bare hipsterdom's deep connections to processes of colonization, black cultural appropriation, and white supremacy. It is as much about hipsters as it is about race in the Atlantic world because, as Greg shows in the book, hipsterdom is deeply colonial. Its fascination with scorn for and theft of black culture is inexplicably tied to the Atlantic slave trade and um, fascism, which I guess that's kind of the way in that I want to start, um, which is to say that, you know, uh, um, I'm interested in all of this book, but I think something that really uh, brought me into it was the question of fascism. Um, and I want to kind of get to that via a question that I am not as familiar with, which is music. So music is a huge part of the book. Um, you re recently contributed a revolutionary playlist to the Polis Project's uh, list of revolutionary playlists. Um, that's very cool. Everyone should go check it out. But so I wanted you to talk a little bit about your relationship to music and how this became such an anchor piece of the book. Um, and again, not just the site of extraction and theft and commercialization of black culture, but also, um, as you suggest, via Woody Guthrie's guitar, a machine that kills fascism. Mm -hmm. Ooh, um, so uh, first, uh, thank you, Chelsea, for being here and for doing this uh, uh, very much uh, at the last minute. You are you are great. Uh, I'm saying this for everyone here. If you didn't know, Chelsea's great. Um, so, uh, you know, again, the first thing I thought about when you asked the question was, um, you know, what um, I guess the scene, the musical scene was uh, like that, uh, that I grew up in, so to speak. And, um, you know, I always listened to, to a lot of different musics, but the first scene I sort of got into, let's say back in France in the uh, early 90s was, you know, punk rock and alternative music. Um, and, you know, locally and, and more broadly, this was a particular scene that was always very, I mean, always in my lifetime in any case and, and around me, very political and, and very much on on a cusp, right? Uh, we'd go to concerts and you'd find uh, communist skinheads and Nazi skinheads, right? And different, sometimes at different corners of the same room. Uh, you'd go to, say, a ska concert and you'd definitely find both of these and, and others. Um, you know, music and politics were always, you know, tied and, and very much on the surface and very much a question of style and very much uh, um, essential in this sense, right? I mean, it was very important to know what a Nazi skinhead looked like as opposed to, say, a communist skinhead. Uh, it could be a matter of, uh, of serious uh, um, bodily, um, uh, of, you know, I don't want to say survival, but, you know, potentially. Um, and so, you know, in, in this way, um, I would say certain kinds of, um, you know, maybe, you know, 
somewhat Eurocentric, I want to say, to at least, uh, you know, in my first experience of them, uh, musical scenes and, and pop cultures uh, were always imbued with those questions, right? Um, you know, you, you, I can't really separate the way I got into or interested into politics from the way I got interested in certain kinds of music. Uh, there was no clear separation uh, between between those different domains, right? I mean, in, again, in those, you know, I don't want to say daily life, but like, you know, immediate uh, experience of it. Um, and, you know, as, as I grew and learned about other things, it became also clear to me that even those things that seem so white, right? Even uh, all those scenes uh, weren't, were never exclusively white, but were always, you know, majoritarily white, uh, weren't just white either, right? Um, you know, the, again, this was partly education, but this was also uh, very much experience, right? Finally realizing this, uh, you know, just you know, for myself, for, for family in some cases, but also uh, learning about different genres and where they came from. So, you know, um, not to be too abstract and maybe too general here, but uh, that's only fed into, into the book, right? I mean, some of these reflections um, and ideas I've literally thought about, you know, for a lifetime. And I don't want to say necessarily in very articulated fashion, uh, but, you know, um, you know, when I started making fanzines with my sister when I was, you know, uh, 12 or 13 or whatever, you know, we actually were already thinking about those things, maybe not in exactly the same terms. Um, but so in this way, it's really an ongoing reflection, right? Which uh, in, in the case of the book, um, you know, it's only impacted by, by more recent developments. I, you anticipated, I, I wanted to follow up and kind of know where you'd been thinking and writing about it before, thinking about experimental zines and things like that. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I wanna talk maybe about style in the writing process later um, if, if those questions come up, but thinking about your way in, I mean, I know that you had sort of a dialogue um, and that this was really a, a way for you to, to fit in some of that thinking into sort of a, a radical um, a, a collective or, or at the very least the book um, series. And so, you know, where, where else have you done this thinking? Um, in what forms and what allowed you to sort of take this form and, and sort of how was that process for you? Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I, I started speaking about this, but so I, I was blessed with with an older sister uh, whose name is Peggy. Uh, she's, I don't think she's watching this, so I can say whatever I want. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but they're all gonna be good things, just don't let her know. Um, and so, you know, I mean, a lot of things we just did uh, together, right? Uh, she's four years older than I am, so she took me to all my first concerts. Uh, we, we played music together uh, and we wrote together. When she was in high school and I was still in, in uh, middle school, she started, um, you know, she started making fanzines and it was just came naturally that, you know, I'd be part of it. Um, so the first, the first articles I ever wrote were, you know, were for those fanzines. Um, you know, um, this necessarily won't say anything to people outside of France, but I grew up in, in Metz in Eastern France. Uh, she went to high school in Nancy, a uh, big rival city, but rival city with an actual musical scene, <laughs> which was, uh, so there were all those great concerts to go see and bands you could interview, you know, somewhat easily, you know. Um, and so, you know, I guess, you know, well, again, anyway, fanzines happened, and so I started writing, and uh, at that at that time, and and the writing stuff for fanzines obviously is is just uh, a free for all. We we just did whatever the hell we wanted um, because you know we had no idea again who was reading it, and we didn't really care, right? I mean, that's that's the point. Right? You do um, you speak about music you like, and bands you like, and films you like, and books you like, and whatever. And then maybe people read it and then maybe they don't and it doesn't matter right it's great um and we transitioned into uh uh into um a webzine you know in the late 90s um where um i think you know all those those forms sort of reflected our, our personal you know uh, evolution i want to say uh, topics got maybe there was always a little bit of, you know, cultural analysis and, and politics, I guess, but we just get older and maybe uh, smarter and uh, get more references and, and, and connections to make. Um, and so uh, in the late 90s, we, um, in early 2000s, we, uh, we started a web scene called melanin.org. 
um, that was really just a continuation of what we'd been doing on paper. Um, and get maybe a more political uh, than, than the fanzines were. But essentially, it was the same idea, right? Uh, we, we talked mostly about music, film, books, and, and what those things meant and, and connections that we, we thought seemed interesting. Um, yeah, I don't want to downplay it, right? I mean, that's, but, but fanzines are, you know, I want to say that they're uh, an interesting, um, uh, you know, uh, training, I guess. Uh, precisely because, again, you can't really take it too seriously. You know, if you, you're lucky if you sell 20 of them, you know, if you sell any of them, uh, it seems only your friends read them. Uh, you don't really know, right? I mean, they, you can't really, they, they, there's no, like, you can't, you can't uh, have too big a head with this stuff, like, you know, because you literally have no idea where it goes. Um, I mean, I guess you could, you could, you could be serious about it. But so, uh, again, that was the, the training and that was also the style, right? I want to say like this was very non-academic because that's not that's not the kind of uh, uh, writing it is. Um, and so this was sort of going back to that, right, in some ways. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, I, I, I want to go and spend more time on melanine.org and sort of find the pseudonyms and the the, the different essays and, and and spend time with that. Because one of the things that I, so enjoyed, I mean, so many things about the book, but was really just being in that style and getting to sort of um, play along and be along, but also um, play myself with that style. Um, and I, I, yeah, in academic writing, that is not um, something that we get to do as much, or maybe sh we should be doing more of. Um, but yeah, I found, I found it to be humor and truth um, and also uh, a, a dialogue and a conversation. It felt, I mean, it's just interesting to think about this sort of um, genesis or at least thinking about these earlier um, experiences of writing that was, a, that were for you based in a conversation and in a sort of a collective at the very least with your sister, but obviously with other people um, and how that to me really um, comes through in the reading. So yeah, I, um, I, I appreciate that background. Um, I wanna, uh, maybe let's see. All right, I wanna encourage people again to submit questions so that we can continue to engage with the audience in conversation. Um, but I'm gonna keep going then with some of my questions, which um, again, for maybe people who haven't um, gotten a chance to read the book, who might be interested, I want you to kind of give us the, the point of um, you doing this uh, 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 sort of analysis of the idea or the concept of hip in hipster. Uh, and with that, I wanna, so you can just give that overview, but I want you to also, um, Maybe tell us whether you didn't go after the word cool enough or what, like, I mean, like, I know cool is related. I just, I, I found myself like wanting to say cool in some of my questions. And I was like, but is cool as problematic as hip? Or like, where is cool in relation to hip? I mean, you use it a lot in the book um, critically. And so I just wonder if you could maybe talk about cool and hip too. Uh, huh. Well, I was, I mean, to me, um, Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess it's one of those things. Where it's like the more seriously you talk about it, the more it becomes like, what, what am I doing? Um, but, <laughs> um, but I mean, to me, like hip is more like, I mean, I think it, it engage, engages more directly um, the way people relate to certain notions, right? Like hip is like to be to be aware of some things, right? To, to be aware of, of what is cool, I guess, if that makes sense. So. Um, uh, I would say maybe that's the difference. Like you know, the, the cool is more like a like a, a more general state <laughs> state of being, I guess, or a state of doing. While hip is like to me like insists on the on the on the awareness of, of what that means. Um, and you know, I guess we, we we sort of started talking about that a little bit at the end of the book club earlier, which you weren't there, so I'm just revealing this to you now. Um, but I mean, to me, there is something about that, right? Awareness and then self-awareness and then awareness of self-awareness and so on and so on, right? Because um, hip implies, again, an in and an out group, right? Uh, you know, your hip is that you know something that a majority of people don't really know, um, whether that's true or not, right? I mean, that's sort of what, what, it, what it rests on. And um, um, in the book club, somebody asked about like sort of references and 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 in jokes and um, you know that, that 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 there were some or maybe too many in the book and and what that means and 
you know, I mean, I guess that's, you know, that's an inevitable function of, of the topic to me, right? I mean, it, it is it is about things that some people might know and that others might not know and that you might not want others to know uh, on purpose, right? I mean, again, you make an in-group um, or you don't build it in this way, but there's a line there, right? There's, yeah, those who are in the know and those who are not. Um, cool, I think, is just, you know, sort of a broader notion in this way, right? Like hip to me is really more about, it, it is about, Again, uh, yeah, awareness and, and self-awareness, yes. Ooh, I, I, I'm glad I wasn't in the book club at the end because I did have to eat lunch, but I'm sad because I really would have liked to have, maybe I would have taken the conversation in a way that wouldn't have been as maybe as as open for people who haven't read the book and who are just coming to the launch. But um, you, you're touching on a lot of things that I want to kind of follow up on. So what, the reason I asked you the question about cool is that I am interested too in the concept of cool hunting that you, um, or the practice of cool hunting really, that you sort of take to task and you, you highlight um, as I would, I would say extremely problematic um, in the book insofar as it is uh, an, like an economy of attention, actually of money, right? Of people cool hunting for things that they can purchase or be a part of, but also of sort of one's efforts like you can cool hunt and spend all your time cool hunting and like create your island of one in this sea of racial capitalism and, and kind of be okay because you're going through this process. Um, so I, and, and then there's this in-group, out-group sort of um, construction of sort of lines and of boundaries and of opacity or of um, indecipherability um, that I think also uh, really, I want to hear you kind of tease out into um, sort of what you're talking about in terms of extraction and, and again, of racial capitalism, which is that um, there are necessary or there are sometimes survivalist creations of sort of those lines and those boundaries um, from racialized violence or from uh, uh, extraction um, that is that is itself violent. And then there's also the cool hunting piece of it that, I mean, I mean, you do this all in the book, so I'm not, I'm, I'm sort of regurgitating some of that, but I want you to kind of speak to that maybe, which is where I was thinking about going with cool. And, and I'm just gonna read this because I found it online and I'm now regretting that because the Google algorithm is going to keep feeding me this website, which I don't, I don't wanna get, but there we go. It's Cool Hunting, a uh, registered trademark. I'm just gonna read the description of it. It's an award-winning independent publication that uncovers the latest intersections of design, culture, and technology. We are a team of writers and editors whose curiosity fuels an ongoing quest for the discovery of true inspiration. We leverage our access, insights, and knowledge, not only to find this, but also to share it with you. And like, eek, um, right? Like, the I'm just thinking about where decolonized sifters into the whole sort of framework of this radical decolonial project. Like, ooh, that's so colonial. And the, it just, anyway, the part of, for me, part of what's so interesting about um, thinking with this book and extrapolating it to so much else is that it really lays bare how this operates everywhere in our sort of uh, late capitalist world. Yeah. It, um, I mean, the metaphors keep coming, right? I mean, there's a way in which, you know, I, I was thinking about, okay, that's a, a very deep cut, but I'll try to, I don't know. Uh, okay. Maybe I'll get back to that. Um, no, actually, I, I'll just Do try it. to. So there's this guy, um, some people are familiar with France might be aware of this guy, uh, called Alain Soral, who's sort of a figure of like French neo fascism. Um, now, uh, if you know him only for that reason, uh, you may not be aware of his career prior to this. Uh, he was, you know, the sort of guy, like for a time, what his specialty was was the analysis of so called urban tribes, right? Like he had this book that I still remember. Um, that was a guide to subcultures, and that would have, you know, I don't know, the 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 skinhead, and it would be like a graph with a drawing with like, what does a skinhead wear? And, you know, and they would do this for every, you know, so-called, you know, yeah, subculture, right? He wrote that guide. Now he's just this figure of, of, uh, of French fascism. And again, I mean, I, to me that, you know, Again, he's sort of the embodiment of, of part of what I, I want to talk about in the book, right? There, there, there's no surprise there. Right? And he would have done this, you know, 20, 30 years before becoming this sort of a, a new French fascist is not really surprising to me, right? There's something about the taxonomy, the mm -hmm. sort of revealing uh, secrets, the, the, you know, the, the, yeah, the sheer colonialism of it, the cool hunting of it that is you know, very directly connected to this. And so to, I think to go back to, to, to what you were saying, um, 
there are fundamental, fundamentally different ways of approaching this, I want to say. And as I say this, I also don't want to say that they're like, you know, essentially different, but there are situations in which uh, being part of that in group is indeed part of is it's 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 about survival, right? It is not about being cool. It's that being cool is is how is how you live, or, or how you keep living, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Right? And so, um, you know, one line that I think makes that clear that I talk about in the book is just how much of that cool derives from cultural practices uh, of the enslaved, right, and uh, of the oppressed, and you know, more generally speaking, not to be too general. Uh, in which case, you know, again, you can you can look at it just as cultural phenomena and just miss out on the fact that you know culture doesn't just come for people's entertainment. Culture is life, right? Culture means something. You don't do music just because it sounds good, as it turns out. You don't wear certain clothes just because they look cool, even though they do look cool, right? Um, and to me, so you know, what we see with hipsters is the sort of uh, you know the, the systematic you know, uh, yeah, I mean, the commodification of, the, of that dynamic, right, quite simply. And, you know, that's fashion and that's other, uh, you know, sort, sort of a, a dilution of, 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 uh, of subculture and, and, and cultural phenomenon. Right? And at some level, it's always the same thing. You know, people create this and, and you know, a small group knows it and then, you know, it gets everywhere and then we move on and whatnot. You know, it's been uh, stuck dry. We can move on to something else that's going to be good. But, you know, what I think is important here, uh, and, and generally speaking, um, is to keep in mind that, yeah, I mean, more often than not, th those phenomena, those early in-groups um, have an involvement in it that means something deeper than just not telling uh, your neighbor what you're talking about, right? Um, again, in the book, I think I made clear that some of the in language is also quite literally a language of survival. Uh, I think in some cases, maybe more metaphorically, obviously, than when you had to survive being enslaved uh, in enslaved societies around the new world. Uh, but um, I think that remains right in many ways. And I think, you know, maybe a, a, a crucial difference uh, in hipsterdom is that it copies the dynamic, uh, but it doesn't need it. Quite, quite mm -hmm. simple. Right? It becomes. It is something to 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 consume. Mm -hmm. Oh, but this gets to this thought I've been having. I mean, oh, I, I I don't want to get. I don't. I want to get to the end, but I don't want to get to the end yet. Um, you know, this question of survival. It's so. Um, either survival, like as in um, um, actual life or death, which again stakes that you make clear in in some um, parts of the book, and there are you know there are sort of. Um, there's a scale of that in some, to some degree, but you're putting it really in the sort of the plantation and in uh, Jim Crow and in sort of these um, these extremely violent, real sort of um, scenarios. And then there's this sort of like, it's not a sick copy, but it's like this idea that like to a degree, and I, I guess I'm asking you to res respond to this idea, like do hipsters or or rather maybe it's the sort of like elder, we were talking, this is book club, sort of talk, so I'll try and define it. Um, later millennial, um, liberal sort of uh, commodity, like like already sort of um, entrenched in the, the system um, idea of cool, um, where in a sense they're, they're hipsterdom, or not their hipsterdom, but they're cool hunting and their energy that they're spending doing that allows them to survive, quote unquote, in sort of a, a very, um, a system that they can't change or sort of a capitalist system that is totally uninterested in any of their individuality or any of their political thought, right? I, so like, is there something that links those two survivals as, 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 as sort of um, grotesque as that is to try to do? I think, I mean, again, uh, I think the latter, I mean, the, the, the hipster survival to me is, I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I think I've recycled that, that, you know that that Marx, um, you know, quote about the you know, history as as drama and then and then false. Right? I mean, he, he's heard it a million times. But um, to me, that that is, you know, it, it's not a bad way of defining what this is about, right? I, um, what's his name? Uh, Dennis Sinnett, who writes a lot about gentrification in, in Brooklyn, he has a, a pretty great um, a blog about this. Um, was, you know, talking quite about, you know, people living in Brooklyn right now and saying, you know, in a nutshell, I'm simplifying uh, 
um, you know, uh, drastically here. But saying, talking to people who basically, you know, pushed people out that used to live there just, you know, by pricing them out, right? Whether or not that's what they meant, that's what happened. And saying that how they now speak of, you know, the, the problems of the area um, in the same terms, you know, as if they were actually somehow being uh, oppressed in their position as, you know, whoever, you know, now owns the condo or maybe they don't own it and that's their oppression, right? And there's a way in which, you know, there's, there's the discourse of survival becomes part of what is also consumed and borrowed, right? And appropriated. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think to some extent it shows, again, a different level of awareness of, of the, if not the history of this, right? But, uh, the, the, the discourse of it, right? And I think it's interesting what you said, where it's like, you know, the, the system doesn't care about the individuality. I'm not so sure about that. I think that's all it cares about, if only because it allows uh, to, to bypass collective action, quite simply, I mean, maybe too simply, but there's a way in which this, this, these grievances, right, which always come down uh, to, to the individual, mm -hmm. uh, replace any other grievances. Right. I mean, it's not about the people that were forced out and had to figure out where else to live. Right. It's about them struggling with God knows what at that moment. I'm not saying these aren't valid grievances, but they obviously ignore like how they you know, participate in a, in a bigger system and how they, they potentially uh, help put other people uh, in trouble. Right. I mean, again, you know, being very, very general, but I think the discourse here that that I um, connect with hipsterdom actually, again, is very much about borrowing like, and taking everything, including that, that language, right? And that to me is interesting because I don't think it's quite adapted to the situation, but it becomes adapted to the situation. Mm -hmm. Well, so that, I mean, you're bringing me to this end question, but we have like, we'll come back to earlier parts um, because actually this, this individuality is really, or it, in requiring that people remain individual and that their individual desires sort of um, can be fulfilled or that those desires are themselves shaped or dictated um, is is really, I think, where we get to at the end. But I want you, so maybe I want you to kind of respond to this, me sort of reacting to this and what, you, what you're doing in the end, because it's so, in my mind, um, uh, profound or, or powerful, both, um, but it also is, could it also to me is is um, sort of oh I don't want to say tragic because that brings us to a lot of other things but whatever it, 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 it part of it feels a little tragic and I'll explain why but um, so yeah I, I back to this idea of cool hunting and of this idea of like individual individual sort of um, really basically spending time money energy effort um, to to hunt cool and to create their cool. I'm calling it an island of one or a party of one um, as sort of rafts to float on or little islands to, to or gardens or whatever in this in this um, extremely um, violent system. Um, but so what I what I read in the end is like this hope that that energy that there is an army or that there's a, an energy, a uh, time, effort, money that could be redirected to something else. Um, it's not right, but it's there. Or at least that's what I'm reading is hope. And so I guess. The question kind of is, you know, is that is that what you're saying? And also then in addition to that, like who and I'm going to maybe read, maybe answer that and then I'll just read or ask you to read if you have the book, because there's one part that I really want to ask you about. But yeah, I'll ask that first question. So that's that's what I hope. <laughs> yeah. oh, this so, like, you do hope. I mean, now I'm like, are you hopeful? Yeah. Okay, uh, I mean, again, I mean, if I'm gonna have to cite Marx again. I'm gonna somebody's gonna beat me up. But uh, uh, you know, that is probably uh, you know what is it like? The situation is so is so dire that it fills me with hope. Um, I'm I'm a pessimist, but I think that also means I'm hopeful. Um, I don't know what else is there uh, to do, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't. So maybe to go back to what to to what I think you were saying, I think that you know the um, um, as you said, the energy is what's interesting here, right? And um, I don't think it's individual. And I think you know again, like making it into an individual um, 
uh, trajectory is is the uh, you know the, the the endless issue here. Because I mean, again, not to simplify things, but um, where you know it, it was interesting. Like, yeah, there's a way to me in which you know 21st century hipsterdom uh, sort of made all of this or made it seem like it was always individual, right? Like, again, you can, you can take this here and there and like, you put it all together and ta-da, that's it. Like you're, you're this cool, uh, you know, monad, right? And, and what's cool about you is, is that your borrowings are, you know, combined in this unique way. You know, it's like, oh, but I only have a dash of this and, you know, a whole bit of that and, you know, 25% of punk or whatever. And, um, you know, I, I yeah, I, I hope it sounds ridiculous because I, I, I'm trying to make to make it sound ridiculous, but it also isn't right. Like, oh, it doesn't have to be. Let's say, but what to me it becomes sort of the issue here is that then it, it sort of um, makes it sound like yeah, you're doing this on your own. Uh, uh, Michael Bronner earlier, I think, was um, um, in the book club was saying you know, the, the, there's a way in which. Uh, um, you know, the pretense of originality is part of the problem, right? Uh, always make it sound like it's new when, when it's not new. And it's not like we don't come up with new combinations or whatever, but like uh, the insistence, insistence on the new uh, and the insistence on the individual to me are the same, right? And they take away from the other option, which is that, yeah, no, we are groups actually, and, and we, we could be doing this together. And again, is that hopeful? Is that naive? Maybe. Is that hopeful? Certainly. But Interestingly enough, to me, that was what was happening uh, with or what kept happening with a lot of those in groups and 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 their dilution, right? Which is like um, you know, there's a way in which that dilution makes it sound like oh, now everybody's doing it, so it doesn't mean anything, and that's sort of it. But like, I feel like dilution was always also making it like now you, you know, you right here with that, that, that you know Uncle Sam finger, right? Like you can do it too. Mm -hmm. And that is the problem because it's not about it's not you know uh, no it's about you joining groups it's not about you doing it for yourself right and I feel like uh, again mm -hmm. hipsterdom sort of mechanized that 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 individualization oh I want to say fake individualization because in the end it's not really you know um, I mean I'm sure it does a lot to Instagram accounts and whatnot but it doesn't really do much even for individuals or maybe. Um, Whatever, I'm sure it does, but you know what I mean, right? Like, it, what it takes away from is exactly how we belong uh, to groups, right? And that, that to me, is, is the, the nefarious aspect of it. Wow. Sure if... No, 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 that, that makes the, I mean, yeah, you're, I get your hope, but also this, the newness and the individual individuality being sort of one of one piece, which is to say that the, the past and the continued sort of um, um, collective groups um, that do have uh, history and power and and lessons um, continually being, you know, um, made new or silenced. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I guess because uh, I want to take up this question from um, Michael that gets to a, a larger sort of um, sort of question of the book. And it's right here beamed up. Can the hipster really be decolonized? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. I don't, I don't actually think so. Um, not to the extent that, I mean, again, um, though I was joking, I mean, I mentioned it in the book and, and again, we, we were just talking about this a little bit, but nobody's a hipster, right? Nobody claims to be one. Uh, if you're one, it's because somebody else is pointing at you, right? And telling you that you are, um, nobody wants to be one and yet they're, they have to be hipsters, right? It's just not a label that you give yourself, uh, which I think is interesting because it sort of implies that everybody knows there's something problematic about it in the first place. Even people who have to be aware that they might fit, you know, the, the label, right? Um, to me, um, you know, as far as decolonization is concerned, uh, it can be because the hipster is sort of uh, both, you know, the, 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 the avant-garde and the, uh, and the the result of colonization. Um, so in this sense, I don't think you you can't be a hipster and be decolonized at the same time. I think if you decolonize a hipster, then the hipster becomes something else. Uh, if that makes sense. So I mean, to that extent, I don't think we can. Um, we have like we have to turn to something else. Right? Hipsters, I think, by definition, are colonial. So. Mm -hmm. Well, but, so that. Yeah, 
I, that's a good, I think for, for Michael's question and it doesn't, right. It's not a, a yes or a no. I mean, you, in the book you say undo, and I wonder if that, you know, what that choice is, whether or not it's that last passage, but with that, because, you know, this gets to sort of this question of that there absolutely are hipsters and no one wants to be the one. Um, but you use a your, there's a, there's a, a you right to the reader. And I wonder if you could tell us more about who that is or what you're envisioning. And that's the last page 138. That's it then, your directive to undo the hipster, embrace the John Brown under the beard. <laughs> well, uh, I am talking to white people in case I wasn't clear. Uh, not that I think you have to be uh, white to be a hipster. I think it's, uh, you know, you will, you will find uh, non-white hipsters. But I do, I do sincerely think that there's, uh, uh, and especially again in this uh, most recent iteration in some ways, you know, as we've seen like historically hipster before it becomes, um, you know, it, 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 there's, a, there's a window there where the term also uh, actually defines people in the in group of, you know, in this case, you know, the jazz scene you know, in, the, in the 30s, right? Uh, before it becomes the term you use uh, for those white people who are entering the jazz scene, whether they're welcome or not, right? Um, at this point, I don't think that, that you know, confusion or that that broadness uh, exists in, in, any longer. Um, so yeah, I mean, in this sense, yeah, I'm I'm talking um, to uh, I mean, in some ways, to not strictly to white people, but very much to to white people. Um, again, <laughs> you know, and not, and again, I don't think the responsibility is strictly on white people, but um, as far as hipsters are concerned, and that phenomenon, I do, I do think it's uh, inseparable from uh, from whiteness. So yeah, that's, that's you. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I think, and I mean, you know, whether or not, it's, it's just interesting to think about the readership and think about how it gets there. I think all of it does a very good job of catching sort of an audience that it needs to catch. But, um, but I, but I wonder, I wonder if you, yeah, do you think there's a, do you, did you think about this as like a delivery mechanism, if that makes sense? Was there a sort of a, like how, Right, you know, thinking about your audience, or did that become sort of like if this is a, uh, if I could put together sort of a a short, um, you know, blurb for call to action, if you will, that that was when you sort of thought about delivery and thought about audience. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, you know, again, I don't want. Um, I feel that that's uh, that would be maybe a. Um, not humble enough right, in a way. I'm not like I no one to call people to action in that way, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and in again, to be clear, to to go back to what I was saying, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing here. But I'm 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 not fully, you know. I, it's not like I consider I'm not part of that potential audience either. I'm just the one writing, so I, mean, I get to I get to I get to say <laughs> things. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it's also uh, more general. I mean, I think it's a, a call. Generally speaking, uh, uh, that I think very obviously applies to me as well. I don't think it, you know. I think we could do, we could all do more. Uh, that's only that only means me as well. Uh, I think that there's much more involvement to 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 be had. There's there are many more things to be done, um, and in that way, I think it applies to anyone who might feel <laughs> targeted or not, for that matter. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, the John Brown bit is very obviously uh, related to whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I don't. I like John Brown. Um, I suddenly feel like he's done more things than I have. So I mean, to that extent, um, you know, um, I think people who might not feel like the U is directed at them uh, might still, you know, consider the call in more abstract ways, right? Uh, I think that you know, there's a way in which that's never not true. Uh, that we could all be doing more, get more involved, and so yeah, to that extent, I think it's a it's a call. But again, like you know, I, I want to make clear, right? It's, that certainly does not come from a place of uh, you know, what are you doing? Well, look at me, I wrote a book. You know? You're not Uncle Samming it in your own way. No, I hope I'm not. It's it's you know, it's meant to be like you know, partly to be honest, it was also like um, you know, people said, well, so. What do you propose? I'll propose anything, but if you do want to call, well, here it is, right? Uh, you know, um, I'm not sure what we could do, but I think we could, we could do other things, right? So, yeah. no, I, mean, I, I think reading the book is a really good start. So I'm, you know, yeah.
Um, <laughs> I want to. I want you to. We're gonna um, get to you doing a reading, which I am excited to hear. And I don't have a passage that I necessarily have in mind, so maybe you can think about that while I also ask you another hard question. Not hard, just you know, one that will involve thought. So if you can think about two things at once. Um, but then I can also uh, suggest one if you if you really don't want to come up with yeah, one. I don't mean just one because okay. I, <laughs> but, I. But so I think maybe in this, in some ways, it seems unfair to end on this question. So maybe we'll have time to squeeze another one in if someone who is. Oh, okay, good. Um, Meg's uh, got a question too. So let and this actually will tie into the question that I have. So Meg, um, I don't know if uh, we can beam this question up, but she's asking: Can hipness and gentrification be disentangled? Is there gentrification without the hipster? Mm -hmm. And sort of one of my questions that I wanted to ask was about, you know, maybe, maybe I'll back up. Um, I think right, there are many things that make great books, but something that I find that makes this a great book and that I think makes your other book a great book is that you are able to take a concept and you do such a, a, a deep and careful job um, of looking at it historically, of tracing its evolution and picking your ways into it that are by no means exhaustive but that it becomes great when in fact, it becomes extremely applicable to any number of other cultural objects or phenomenon. So um, with the uh, Black Avenger, uh, there are many other Black, like I read your book and then I was like, oh, Black Avengers, right? It, it, it highlights and it illustrates. And I think the book does the exact same thing. And I also understand in 138 pages, that's like, you can't do everything. I think gentrification is maybe one of those that could have been another like chapter in and of itself. And so I wonder maybe if you could talk about some of the other things that are absolutely um, part of this larger framework that could be could have been chapters or ways in, including potentially gentrification. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, yeah, uh, and and uh, to 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 go to uh, to Meg's question, um, I think hipness and gentrification can be disentangled. Uh, is there gentrification without the hipster? Um, I want to say, I mean, so I, I don't know that gentrification works the same way absolutely everywhere. So I, I want to say that, that there may be a gentrification without the hipster. Uh, certainly, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm thinking of this sort of, uh, like urban, uh, re like urban gentrification specifically, right? I mean, the way, um, you know, areas that often well, yeah, at least in some cases, were first a very, a very upper class, and then became, you know, more working class, and now are becoming uh, upper class again. Uh, I think that specific cycle, uh, as you know, I don't want to say always, but like certainly um, uses uh, hipsters or at least you know uh, artists in, in in an interesting way, right? Um, or at least, yeah, a sense of cool, right? That's definitely be, become part of that cycle. Uh, in that, uh, that's that you know, it's thought that the vanguard of gentrification have to be people who uh, blunt the impact of what's coming after them right, in some ways. Uh, that do find genuine interest often uh, in in living in areas that you know, just not just because maybe they might be cheaper or you know, whatever reason brings. Uh, that tends to be the reason why uh, artists you know move into a certain working class neighborhood. Um, but, it, but it is their presence that it certainly participates. I want to say symbolically often, maybe more than, than, uh, actually, you know, um, uh, economically, uh, in bringing the waves uh, of, of gentrifiers, right? Uh, I don't blame artists for this, uh, but they, you know, whether they, they like it or not, they, they, they serve, you know, they, they have this sort of cultural capital that I think becomes, becomes part of that, that wave, right? Um, again, maybe not to generalize. I don't. I don't know that it's uh, always the case, uh, but you know, in, in some of the places we we talked about, and certainly in New York City, I mean, it's literally it's still moving, right? It's been moving east in, in, in this weird way, uh, you know, uh, in the past, you know, fifty years or so. Um, now I think I forgot your question. Oh, other, other, I mean, and, and, and to be fair, like you do talk about gentrification in the book, absolutely. And, and, and Williamsburg factors in too, right? But if there are other, other ways in, and in fact, um, maybe if you don't want to answer that, there's also another question from uh, Michael Bush, 
which is, can you talk about the ways in which gender dynamics factor into your analysis of the hipster? Yeah, that's definitely, that, that's, you know, and, and, and God knows uh, back to you, uh, <laughs> uh, killed me for this. That's definitely something I, I could have talked about more as well. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, this this is a, there's an interesting dimension. This is uh, the conversation uh, we've had with Bakhti that I'm now revealed to the world. Uh, Bakhti kept saying, you know, you have to talk about canning and, and mason jars and, you know, the, the you know urban gardening and, and all these things that are not just, uh, that were eminent and I still are eminently gendered. Even, you know, even though you, you know, it, was, it wasn't just about women, um, it was very much, it was very gendered in the discourse and it's also the sort of, um, a proto-feminist recuperation of, of those uh, activities that were gendered for many of them, right? Uh, if they weren't uh, for hipsters, they certainly were historically. I think part of the way uh, that got recycled certainly played with, with gender dynamics. Um, so that's not really in the book, but we we, we had those conversations with Bakhti quite a few times and uh, she has a point, she uh, should have listened uh, and, but you know, Whatever. That's a, that's a different story. Uh, but yeah, there would be there would be a, a, a lot to say about this, especially because I think um, one of those dynamics is, is hardly the only one. But I do think those uh, you know, recuperation of the sort of old timey domestic activities, um, at least symbolically, really participates also in this sort of uh, um, conservative slash fascist turn. Mm. Um, and you know. I still, again, like I, I don't have a full-fledged analysis uh, analysis of this, um, but to me, uh, not by chance is that also opened the door to this sort of new, uh, cool, like you know, sexist fascism. That uh, you know, again, I'm thinking of examples in France, but they're everywhere. That that is often bended by women, right? And then this sort of like, yeah, you know, like domesticity is cool. And I think, you know, again, that's not all of it, but in, in very interesting ways, it, it does, that, that discourse rests on the, the sort of, um, well, at least is made possible to some extent by the, um, the hipsterization of some, like of, of a, some old forms of domesticity, if that, if that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not being very articulate, but I think there's a lot more to be said about that that I did not say in the book. So that was, <laughs> that was your question. That is definitely a chapter that could have been. Um, there are other chapters, you know, I mean, uh, I'm mostly focused on the on, on Black diasporic culture. Uh, obviously, that is not the only culture that is being co-opted and, and uh, and borrowed and appropriated uh, by, by hipsters. So, you know, they, those are other chapters that could have been, uh, but, you know, again, yeah, the, this wasn't supposed to be too long a book. So I, I think those are some, some of the many things I ended up not talking about. No, I mean, no, I, 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 oh, I'm getting, getting back. Is that me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, well, um, maybe we'll just go to you. Oh, no, now it's gone. I wanted to go to you reading, but um, I think they figured out the sound. Um, so I do want to maybe just think about um, before we go to your reading. And do you have do you have a passage that you want to read? I did not have time to think about that. Oh, uh, all right. Read. Well, there's another question. So while okay, one more question while you think about it, and then we will we'll go to a reading. Um, so this is from Michael O'Regan. Um, while hipster aesthetic is very visible in popular culture, do other capital bearers, tourists, international students, Russian money in the housing sector, um, have more of an impact on gentrification? Oh, on, on gamification? Or oh, gentrification. gentrification. Oh, gamification. I'm, oh, interesting. I, let's, so, I'm I have that as gentrification because we're talking about the housing sector. So. Right. Yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, so the answer is yes. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, again, right? It's not like every like hipsters are not the um, you know <laughs> guilty of everything, right? They're not the uh, they're not the, the the whipping boy here, or the uh, the scapegoat. Um, and yes, of course, they, 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 there's more money, and there are more actors uh, involved here. Um, again, I mean. It, I'm, I'm talking in, in some ways and focusing almost exclusively on, on cultural capital in, in this case, right? Uh, and, and part of, you know, um, 
you know, yeah, part of the point of the of the book and part of what I'm doing with, you know, maybe too narrow a focus, um, it's the, you know, the book's not about gentrification, right? So, I mean, if I were to write one, which I would not because I'm certainly not a specialist, um, but yeah, there would be more to say than just talk about artists and, and, and hipsters. Um, what I was interested in was showing how artists and, and, well, and hipsters more specifically do get involved in gentrification. Well, that might not seem, um, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious, actually. I mean, it's been a conversation, certainly, uh, when you talk about Brooklyn. Uh, um, but yeah, no, I mean, yeah, my I, know, yeah. There, I think there's this, this, and this was, again, a book club discussion, but I think it's really worth thinking about how that, not just gentrification, but sort of some of the phenomena that you look, look at, look like one thing in their sort of initial or one of their, maybe we could say earlier waves of sort of um, uh, uh, presence in the popular cultural sphere. And how, I, and I hear I'm thinking about just DC, Washington DC real estate, how what would have been a place where artists and hipsters would have been useful, for example, or right to, to in order to push, you know, push, make, make a neighborhood, um, you know, for the next group of people. Now it's actually just real estate sort of, and the market itself, like marketing something that looks hipstery, but it never was. And that's, they just create new neighborhoods and make names for them. And so it's an interesting way that that has already gotten it's no longer even about sort of people and their potential um, cultural appropriation. It's about a market that just creates its own opportunities to gentrify. Yeah. And I think here again, I mean, um, I think, you know, Sarah Schulman, who I, I quote in the book, certainly has a much better analysis than I could give uh, that I think uh, ties to, to Michael's question, which is like the hipster, uh, the hipster aesthetic, I think allows and, and hides those other uh, dynamics at, at hand, right? I mean, as you say, there's, there's a way in which um, it doesn't even have to be tr truly, like it doesn't have to be about hipsters. It just has to look like it's about hipsters. And at some point, you know, maybe it is. Yeah, um, I was saying earlier, again, I, I mentioned Dennis Sennett, who, uh, who writes about uh, the, the gentrification of Brooklyn. And he mentioned how, you know, many people who he would certainly define as hipsters sort of, uh, use this 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 language of oppression, right? That like you talk about the 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 you know whatever problems they're facing. I'm guessing with you know with renters, with maybe those capital bearers that, that Michael mentions. Um, but yeah, they, they're using the aesthetic precisely to do whatever they want, right? Like the, it's it's a it's a sign that's been emptied of of any any meaning in this sense. And to me, what's interesting and to go back to Schulman is just, she says, but you know the stages to this, you know, you may start with actual artists. And, and by the time, you know, they help make uh, gentrification uh, possible, those artists themselves are being pushed out. Right? Uh, they've, they're made to represent something that they don't embody, right? She says, like, you know, for all, like, when we think of, you know, I don't know, uh, 80s, uh, New York City, no wave, you know, whatever, even what I have in mind. She said, well, for all the, the 10, 20, 30 names that you know, there's hundreds that have completely fallen by the wayside that you never, never saw because they were so unsafe for, you know, for, um, and, uh, for, for mainstream culture that nobody remembers them and they've never made it even halfway into, um, you know, a ma mainstream culture. Even, you know, our memory of, of radical culture is also packaged, right? Mm -hmm. In this, so, um, you know, I'm I think- I'm gonna drop that like five minutes before the end, <laughs> but- yeah, but so you know, capital bearers, like tourists, whatever. Yeah, you may see them, but like I think I would imagine part of what they do is actually uh, try not to be seen, right? And so in this sense, hipster uh, aesthetics matter uh, precisely because they've become sort of a uh, short shorthand for for gentrification and very willfully, right? It, by by mm -hmm. you know what, right? That was great. So yes, I just want to reiterate that you were um, alluding to, and and when that is in your book that. Um, well, maybe you can just re-say it. <laughs> that um, our what we understand or, or our concept of what is radical is itself sort of packaged or determined. It's not. Yeah, that that is, I think, a crucial piece of the discussion. But let's go to your reading. We'd love to hear you and your voice um, uh, read some of this. Okay. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll skip part of this, but maybe I'll read uh, something that's close to the end. Um, that starts with uh, with a question you may, you may that might sound familiar. And so, uh, can we decolonize hipsters? Uh, good question. How do you decolonize the colonial army? 
This bending seems like a place to start maybe, except it has long been the hipster ammo to melt away in the greater population, Kaiser Soze style, when every doofus in the room has finally figured out what the deal was. But occupation may become less ostentatious. It may become less newsworthy. The occupy, occupying army never actually goes anywhere. The hipster moment is over, but former hipsters did not stop being so overnight. They have grown now. They're slowly retreated from the front lines of cultural wars and taken off their uniforms, but they're not done. Many have simply turned into nice white parents and moved on to destroying public education or urban farming and also repaving the streets they took over with good intentions, among other hobbies. They may be redeemable, but let's not hold our breath. Worth still, worth still is that we can and should expect the hipster army to rise again when good things come back. So how can we avoid that? I'll be frank, there is no easy answer here beyond imagination. There is nothing we should strive to save in hipsterdom as we know it. The cycle of appropriation, digestion, and regurgitation of cool is racism and capitalism in action. Kill capitalism and you decolonize hipsters. There, done. All right, maybe I'll stop here. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe like there is a lesson to be learned from history near and far. Maybe there is something to be gleaned from Shulman's friends, the unsung artists who moved to New York to become New Yorkers rather than to colonize, who made uncompromising art inseparable from political movements. Maybe we can start again at the beginning, at the attraction one may feel for a culture they did not grow into, but nevertheless, maybe against all odds, feel sincerely partial to, Whatever makes one dance to a beat, sing to a song, nod to a painting, which may not totally, totally be explained away by, by upbringing and social formatting, which even flies in the face of this programming. In Mambo Jumbo, Ishmael Reed described Jess Brew, a virus which, if it becomes pandemic, will mean the end of civilization as we know it. Dance apocalyptic. This one may hit too close to home in times of COVID, but bear with me. The virus symptom in, in the novel is an uncontrollable urge to dance that might evoke the dancing plague of 1518, except just grew is an anti-plague. It does not kill, it saves. Not like the holy black teeth Marinetti found in the mud of a factory gutter in his feverish dreams of racist exploitation, but like a black tide of mud with the potential to engulf us all and give the old world new life. The dance crazes of the jazz era that was just grew on the offensive, contaminating the youth, a, a phenomenon the wallflower order, the age-old secret society of whiteness, recognizes exactly for the existential threat that it is. Today your ass, tomorrow your mind, and then the world. The danger of black culture is that it may convince people that there are better things to do with oneself than whiteness. We can't have that. In the novel, The Wallflower Order manages to thwart Jess Group, notably by putting some stiff academic moves on it. Black intellectual chaperoned by white eminence gris contain Jess Group with the best worded intentions. They codify dance steps into manuals. They say what's good and what isn't. They put some fig leaves on humping crotches and all goes back to normal. Hipsters never stood a chance. Or did they? There is a moment there when the virus hits and all that matters is the act of dancing, singing, having sex, the politics of joy and community. Famed anarchist thinker Emma Goldman had exactly this in mind when responding to a comrade berating her for a tendency to slay on the dance floor, she told him that our cause could not expect me to become a nun and that the movement would not be turned into a cloister. If it meant that, I did not want it. I want freedom, the right to self-expression, everybody's right to beautiful, radiant things. Free your ass, your mind will follow. There buried near the roots of hipsterdom, so close it can almost touch it, is an act more than a pose, a moment rather than an attitude, when being hip still means knowing what's up and what's up is revolution. Under the layers of snark and self-consciousness and cool, maybe the hippening is and has always been happening. I don't know how long to read from your stuff here. Uh, thank you. That was fantastic. All right, all right. So this concludes this book launch, but that doesn't mean that it has to end because everyone who hasn't gotten the book can go get it. Um, there are links in the uh, that were available, but also um, hopefully continue discussion about this. Um, it is provocative. Here we go. Get your copy. Thank you so much. Congratulations.
Greg, this is really exciting. And yeah, thanks thank again. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thanks to everyone for organizing this. Ready Gold Book Collective, Chelsea for showing up, Back T Paulist Project, Warscapes. You are great. Uh, oh, our books also, of course, for actually publishing this. That was nice. Uh, and yeah, everybody that I cannot see, but that may be out there in the ether. Uh, thanks for being here. This was great. Great. Thanks, everyone.